Hey everybody, welcome to the Big Book Study Workshop. My name is Joanne and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, we will be keeping everyone muted for the duration of the workshop with the exception of the facilitators, which are Tony R, Joe C, and myself, Joanne C. This is not a conventional AA meeting where we would share our experience, strength, and hope with each other. This is a Big Book Study Workshop. The purpose of which is to take members of AA through the program of recovery as it's laid out in our basic text, Alcoholics Anonymous, or more commonly known as the Big Book. We will not be referencing any other literature or versions of the 12 steps. Our aim is to help educate and challenge your beliefs about the program of recovery, so we might sift through some of the inaccuracies that circulate within our fellowship. Our aim is to challenge current beliefs by comparing them to what our basic text says. We simply wish to educate those who want to know more about our program of recovery. Please feel free to ask questions in the Zoom chat feature. We will try to periodically answer any relevant questions as we go along. Anyone behaving inappropriately or in an abusive manner will be removed from the workshop um, and you will not be permitted to return. So on that note, Tony, do you want to open us up? I'm an alcoholic. My name is Tony. It's so Brad today, April 8th, 1989. We're going through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that was uh, stated earlier. Um, what we usually open this meeting with, we determine, it kind of sets the, the tone, what we're hoping to accomplish, and they, they do kind of cover this in We Agnostics. We'll start with the set of side prayer. Joe, you all ready tonight? Ready to go. Yeah, oh, I'm that's ready. what I like to hear, Joe. Yeah, Joe, alcoholic. Everyone, this is called the set aside, Sarah, set aside prayer or lay aside prayer. Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my illness, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Right on. Thank you for having us in your homes, being a part of this. We do this modem to modem, shoulder to shoulder, and hopefully uh, um, our experience can help better uh, understand this process i've been doing this now uh, big book study workshops a little over 30 years got introduced to the program of alcoholics anonymous 31 years ago i've been in the fellowship since 1978 um the first time i got introduced to the program of alcoholics anonymous which is contained in here was in 1989 and and i've been uh sober as the result of the application of these principles ever ever since where we're at tonight, we're at, we're just finishing up Bill's story going into There is a Solution. Anybody get a chance to read There was a Solution this week and kind of go over some notes? Show of hands, I can't hear you, but you know, you can always kind of go, yep, yeah, I'm here. How many people are here right now? That's not too bad. Two people. That's good. Three, four. There we go. The hardest <laughs> part, the hardest part about these kind of sessions, whether in person or in the meetings, is being present. So if you find yourself wandering too much, one of the things my sponsor suggested to me is just come back to the moment, take a big breath, and kind of remind yourself why you're here and what you're hoping to do, and keep an open mind, and we're going to go through this process. So we covered a lot of information last week. Um, Joe's going to cover a bit of um, some of the high, high notes in and uh, in, uh, the doctor's opinion, and Joanne will kind of bring us to where we're at in Bill's story and kind of hit some high notes. So, Joe, why don't you take us through some uh, some important features here? Yeah. Hey, guys, again, Joe Alcoholic. Um, you know, it was really interesting. We hit we hit some of these highlights uh, at the last session on Tuesday, and I made a comment saying that the doctor had worked with over 40,000 of us, and, and, and that's true. He worked with over 40,000 patients, but uh, what, he, what he had come to regard, and if we look at page XXV, and this is going to be, a, we're going to hit some key highlights, and, and I really advise you have your pen, your highlighter here, because it's going to really build up to something here. And so he goes on on XXV, he says, uh, To whom it may concern, I've specialized in the treatment of alcoholism for many years. In the late 1934, I attended a patient who, though he had been a competent businessman of good earning capacity, was an alcoholic of a type I had come to regard as hopeless. And through good sponsorship, we kind of looked at it again, because I had made the comment, but we had to look at it and see where the facts were in that. And yes, he had worked with over 40,000 and I had to keep an open mind, right? Because in my, my, in my view, how I had seen it was only a singular way. I only saw it the way it was mentioned to me, but we looked at it again together and, uh, and, and it was very specific. And what he claims here is of a type. Yes, he worked with over 40,000, but 
he came to regard a single type as hopeless. And if we go on to, uh, if we go on to here, page XXV triple I now, we'll hit a highlight there. We believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving, craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average tempered drinker. These allergic types, again, the type, can never safely use alcohol in, in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, the reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Again, this type, a specific type, and he comes to regard them as people who suffer from this allergy, the phenomenon of craving. And once it's developed, once they found they cannot break it, it, it becomes dominant in their in their lives, in our lives, right? He goes on to say, down a little bit, middle of the page, if any feel that psychiatrists directing a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental, let them stand with us a while on the firing lines. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of these problems become a part of their daily work and even their sleeping moments. And the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years of experience that we have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation of this, of these men than the altruistic movement now growing up among them. What was beautiful about that is that he became aware of the physical allergy in these types, in the types that he's talking about that exhibit the physical allergy. What he also came to realize in his own humility as a nationally known chief physician of this national prominent hospital was there was nothing that they could do for these types. And he gets on into that at the bottom here and he, and he gets into what these types and he gets, he talks about the physical part and then he gets a little bit into the, into the mental states. He goes, men and women drink essentially at the bottom here, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it's injur injurious, they cannot after time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They're restless, irritable and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they succumb to the desire again, he, 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 he segues it to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over unless the person can experience entire, entire psychic change. There is very little hope of his recovery. So what he's unable to do as a nationally prominent chief physician is produce such an psych, essential psychic change for this type specific. Yes, he's worked with over 40,000 patients, but with this type, his methods, which he employed, have availed him nothing in, in helping us. And that's why he goes on to make that statement on the previous page. You try standing on, on the front lines. You try watching the despairing wives. You see these men and women coming in and out of our facility. We're aware of what the problem is, but we have no method for them. We have no solution to give to them. Then he gives a little bit of hope here, and he says, on the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change occurs, has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems, he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. And I'll let you guys read on the rest there, but one more highlight I want to hit up is that it's on XXX now. I'm going to hit up two things before I end this. In the bottom paragraph, it says, all these and many others, he's talking about people suffering from certain emotional types and maybe business types and all these people that have uh, certain conditions of, of the human variety. But he, he goes, none of that make it, it doesn't matter. None of the, all that's secondary. What he says here, based off what, what he's witnessed, is all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomena of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. And in that statement there, he's just, he's, 
you got to imagine what kind of despair he must be in. His hands are up in the air. He says, I don't know what to do for you, for you types. There's nothing I can employ to you that can help you recover from this illness. And, and what I love here is now we'll go to XXI and, is a, and we'll witness his own humility again. So he goes, what is the solution? Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. But one year prior to the experience, a man brought into the treatment for chronic alcoholism, he had, been par he had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be the case of path pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted that he believed that for him, there was no hope. Following elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. Now, this is what I love about the doctor because he goes on to endorse what we're about to present to you. He accepted the plan outlined in this book. And, and that's a very powerful statement because he's endorsing the fact that what this solution is provided to people of this type is doing for us what he couldn't do as a, as a chief physician. And, and then I'll hit up one more thing here. Actually, no, you know what? I think that's, I think that's pretty good. I, I will finish off this paragraph. One year later, he called to see me, and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partially recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended from a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck. Had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and, and contentment. I talked with him for some time, but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. And that's as a result of him accepting the plan outlined in this book. So we're hitting on the key notes about the physical allergy. We're hitting on that if, if you are of this type, nothing, it's going to be repeated over and over. That's the step one promise. There's nothing, no humanly possible great physicians, people, or anything could do for us types except for an entire psychic change. And this is what that book uh, produces in the form of, of the steps. Tony? So hit some highlights. That was awesome, Joe. So we see in, in the forward of the first edition, it says, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So they're talking about two symptoms here in regards to alcoholism, right? And so we don't know what those are. So the doctor kind of expands on that. And he says the first symptom, which all these people seem to have who are alcoholic is what? What is the one symptom that all these alcoholics have in common? You want to the answer in the chat? Yeah. So everybody take a moment and just answer in the chat what you think the correct answer to Tony's question is. So then, then he goes on to say, once he explains this, one symptom that makes them alcoholic. That's what makes them alcoholic. Then he says what well, Joe was reiterating too, that there's certain types that moral psychology don't seem to work with. He's, he has a lot of types in his facility who's he's very successful with. Then there's a certain type where, where it's beyond his scope or beyond his expertise to bring about this change that's necessary for these types to recover. And what he did, he witnessed this person upon his third treatment required some information that he put into practice and recovered. In other words, had a psychic change. So he witnessed that, that this thing was now possible, the impossible seemed possible, that these types he was not able to reach through a certain group of ideas put into practice, they were able to recover. And so he kind of witnessed this thing and goes, now we seem to have an answer for these types that moral psychology don't work for. And what's really confusing, there's a lot of types in our fellowship what moral psychology works for for now. Right, they're able to abstain for now, right? And, a lot, and later on, they'll talk about a lot of us can stay sober for months or years given good reason. But if you don't understand alcoholism, what he was saying, unless you acquired this psychic change, this is just a matter before you drink again. So he clarified that there's only one thing that seems to save these people. What was the one thing that seemed to save these people? So that's the second question that he clarifies in his findings that he witnessed. So there's two questions. 
What was the first thing that these people all had in common? You could put that in the chat. And the second thing, what was the only solution that he found or witnessed would save these people from themselves? Because he talked about psychologically, there's something different about them. He's starting light conversations here because he's going to build on that, right? And then he gave two examples of people who were afflicted with this illness, who became sold on these ideas. So then we get to Bill's story, and this is where kind of Joanne, so you guys could answer those questions while Joanne kind of brings us up to where we are, the purpose of Bill's story and where we're at. Joanne, you want to hit us up? Okay. Thanks, Tony. Um, okay, so through the doctor's opinion, we get from the doctor's point of view, his observations after treating many alcoholics for a, a period of time, close to 20 years. Um, he educates us on the... Um, the symptoms of alcoholism as he's observed and then the next chapter would stand to reason to give us um, how these symptoms exhibit themselves in somebody's life right a case study of alcoholism if you will i think um, most of us have been given the um, instructions to take the big book home read bill's story try to identify with it I don't know about the rest of you, but I had very little in common with a middle-aged white dude from the mid-1930s. Um, I found it really hard to kind of relate to anything that Bill was saying, um, channeling it and filtering it through my own thinking, right? Um, it's <laughs> <laughs> Which would be a problem. <laughs> I've heard you before. A disclaimer. <laughs> Um, but when it's, it's presented as just a case study of, of alcoholism exhibiting itself in somebody's life, um, and it's not me trying to find myself in Bill's story, um, it becomes a little easier to see the key points that we're going to go through now um, that the book is trying to convey before we move on to there is a solution. So we'd um, be an so, a, a observer of somebody who's afflicted with alcoholism. That's the point. Yeah, that yeah. Saying, so the doctors right? explain yeah. how he observes these symptoms. You know, yeah. the, um, the allergy, the uh, this this desperate attempt of the first drink is repeated over and over and over again until unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. And all of that would read a little like stereo instructions if it wasn't at once followed up by the story of these symptoms exhibiting themselves in in somebody's life. And we see um, the, we see the buildup of that by a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So we see that the, that language is starting to expand now, right? And we'll see a demonstration of that in Bill's story. Awesome. Yep. Okay. So if a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body, we now have the doctor's opinion on what that means. And now we're going to find out what it looks like in an alcoholic's life. So on page one of Bill's story, um, you know, Bill, like many of us, finds uh, finds alcohol um, during the course of um, World War I. Um, he uses it to ease his loneliness. Um, and by page two, Bill is already suffering the consequences. So of, what, of, what, what do we call that? The promises, right? <laughs> 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 Found the promises in a drink. No, yeah, sorry. yeah. <laughs> I'm experiencing it. <laughs> yeah, I do have to uh, comprehend the word serenity and no peace. I uh, intuitively yeah. know how to handle situations that used to baffle. That's right. I see how my experience <laughs> can takes benefit everybody. Drinks. That's right. <laughs> um, Bill is already experiencing the consequences of the allergy, even though he doesn't know it. Um, you know, but, but I'm willing to admit that any one of these consequences has anything to do with his drinking, even trying to convince his wife that she's off her rocker for, by suggesting it, um, making excuses for a lot of the consequences, any other excuse other than his actual drinking. Um, but, but really very quickly by page five, um, and that's where we'll go to just to start off. Uh, it says right at the top of the page, liquor ceased to be a luxury. It became a necessity. Bathtub gin, two bottles a day, and often three got to be routine. Sometimes a small deal would net a few hundred dollars, and I would pay my bills at the bars and delicatessens, you know, more commonly known as payday loans and um, and the late night last call guy, right? Um, sometimes this, I, this would end on endlessly, and I began to wake in very early in the morning, shaking violently. A tumbler full of gin, followed by a half done bo dozen bottles of beer, would be required if I were to eat any breakfast. Nevertheless, I still thought I could control the situation. And there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. Anybody um, have that experience? Yeah. Experiencing the consequences of drinking, um, excessive drinking, but still being under the impression that somehow you're going to be able to control it. Yeah. 
drink without consequence or periods of sobriety and then being able to drink like a gentleman or controlling yourself without learning your lesson, right? He suddenly gets this really promising business opportunity, um, you know, when when the economy was at a low point, 1932. Um, and this probably looked like needing to be somewhere at a certain time on a certain day. And I think we can all relate that that even the most important of um, of commitments just suddenly vanished. Right. Um, and, and so did his, his chance. <laughs> like corn. <laughs> So, you know, it starts to to experience more serious consequences as a result of his drinking. And and now he starts making these firm resolutions, right? He says, I woke up. This had to be stopped. I saw I could not take so much as one drink. I was through forever. And I, I think it's probably important to note that, that that Bill in this moment meant it. You know, he, he was probably being very honest. You know, he probably meant it with every fiber of his being. Before then, I had written lots, lots of sweet promises, but my wife happily observed that this time I meant business, and so I did. But shortly afterward, I came home drunk. There had been no fight. Where had been my high resolve? I simply didn't know. It hadn't even come to mind. Someone had pushed a drink my way, and I had taken it. Was I crazy? I began to wonder, for such an appalling lack of perspective seemed near being just that. So his drinking has put his marriage on the line, it's put his career on the line, it's put his financial situation on the line. He he makes a, a firm resolution to himself that this has to be stopped. You know, he's starting to see that he can't take so much as one drink, um, but yet he continues to drink in spite of that knowledge. Um, renewing my resolve, he tries again. Um, this should all sound very familiar. Um, some time passed and confidence began to be replaced with cocksureness. Um, I could laugh at the gin mills. Now I have what it takes, right? All of these um, plans and designs that we think have placed us in some sort of position of neutrality. One day I walked into a cafe to use the telephone. In no time I was beating on the bar asking myself how it happened. As the whiskey rose in my head, I told myself I would manage better next time. But I might as well get good and drunk then. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Might as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, one, you know, that's that's the the allergy itself exhibiting itself. You know, now now that he's you know feeling some guilt, shame, and remorse about taking a couple of drinks after the intention of not having anything to drink, um, you might as well go ahead and get good and drunk now because now he's suffering from something that's beyond his mental control. Well, isn't that the goal? Who who likes the idea of a couple of drinks? Who likes the idea of good and drunk? I like the idea of good and drunk without consequences, right? <laughs> Like, like, if I could have just stayed good and drunk with a consequence, we, we'd all still be good and drunk, right? Well, I, I think that, that some of us probably did try to exert some sort of control over the amount that we took, right? There's there's nothing like the heaven provided between drinks 6 and 10, right? Like, and if I could have stayed there for the rest of my life, I wouldn't be talking to you fine people right now. <laughs> the remorse, horror, and hopelessness of the next morning are unforgettable. The courage to do battle was not there. My brain raced uncontrollably and there was a terrible sense of impending calamity. I hardly dared cross the street lest I collapse and be run down by an early morning truck for it was scarcely daylight. An all night place supplied me with a dozen glasses of ale. My writhing nerves were stilled at last. A morning paper told me that the market had gone to hell again. Well, so had I. So impending calamity, what is that? What is he talking about? Are you asking me? Yeah. That, that fear, that fear that everything is about to fall apart. Would that be the noise in his own mind? Yeah. Climb the, I mean, yeah. That, that, that intense anxiety that uh, perhaps maybe nothing external seems wrong, but you just know it's wrong. You know, um, there, that, that everything is about to fall apart. And then this chatter of the mind, yep. Well, so had I. The market had, would recover, but I wouldn't. That was a hard thought. Should I kill myself? No, not now. Then a mental fog settled down. Gin would fix that. So two bottles and oblivion. So we're not, uh, you know, Bill's not experiencing, um, you know, a little bit too much partying, you know, some some excessive drinking at family gatherings. He's drinking for an entirely different reason now, drinking to not exist. Um, the mind and body are marvelous mechanisms for mine endure this agony for two more years. 
Um, and just to keep hitting the highlights, if we run over to page seven, we'll start to find out about Bill's first trip to the hospital. Um, Bill's brother-in-law was a physician, and through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabilitation of alcoholics. So at this point, Bill's made um, many firm resolutions. Um, he's meant it with every fiber of his being. Um, he's wanted to put his marriage first. He's wanted to put his business first. He's wanted to put his financial security first. He, he's, he's wanted to make his life better. Um, but he's found that he's been unable to do that on his own. On his own. So he's placed in a, a nationally known hospital. Um, and under the so-called Belladonna treatment, his brain cleared and hydrotherapy, mild exercise helped. Best of all, I met a kind doctor who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill, bodily and mentally. So for the very first time, somebody with um, some medical background and some experience in the treatment of alcoholics sits Bill down and starts to explain to him the symptoms of alcoholism. It relieved me that uh, somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained a desperate desire to stop. We're not talking about somebody who's trying to figure out how to drink and get away with it. We're talking about somebody who has a desperate desire to no longer drink again. Understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. For three or four months, the goose hung high. This would be a good description of, of a good portion of our fellowship when they arrive at AA for their very first meeting. They get a little bit of information from some, some other members in the fellowship. They attend some meetings. They start making some human connections. Things start to feel better. You get a job, you get a paycheck, you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever. And, and it, it's the goose hung high, right? Life is going much better. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. So the doctors explained the symptoms of alcoholism. It doesn't sound like Bill's really actually gotten uh, um, it through its head, you know, through his head, that second symptom, that inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or wish. Um, but he continues on feeling that just because he's feeling better, therefore he must be better. But it was not for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. So now we're into Bill's second, um, second trip to treatment or to the hospital. This was the finish, the curtain it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure, delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain. I think a good portion of us probably have received ill diagnosis as a result of our excessive drinking or the lifestyle that comes along with it. Um, and a good portion of us might actually uh, be able to share in this experience that even that wasn't enough to keep us away from the first drink. And it wasn't enough for Bill either. Uh, she would soon have to give me over to the undertaking, undertaker of the asylum. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. Um, he goes on to say and, 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 and summarize how he, he really thought of himself as being a good problem solver and that he was able to, uh, to you know, solve his other problems. But for when it came to liquor, for some reason, it just seemed to be uh, he was unable to muster the power necessary um, to avoid the desperate attempt of the first drink. And he goes on to say that no words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And it's probably, you know, a good point at, at this at this stage of Bill's story to recognize that, that that's a decent amount of surrendering, you know, and if, if surrendering was the solution to alcoholism, um, Bill's story would actually continue on in a very different manner than it does. Um, he's, he's not, again, drinking to, to have a good time. Um, he's not even enjoying his drinking anymore. This is a, a classic case of not being able to live with it and being completely and utterly unable to live without it. And he has acceptance about his situation. Yeah, acceptance, surrender, all of those um, those little nuggets we like to toss around. Um, Bill's experiencing all of those things. And he's and again, done, and he's done not, step one 100%. Yeah, not sufficient to bring about any kind of uh, change that the doctor had described um, in the previous chapter. 
uh, trembling, he stepped from the hospital. Um, fear sobered him for a bit, and then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. So he's out of the hospital for a second course of treatment. Um, you know, whatever it is that Bill experienced during that time was horrific enough for fear to sober him for a bit. Again, that's probably something that a lot of us um, um, can relate to. Um, but on our remiss to stay in 1934, he was off again. Would that be like play the tape through, think it through, call somebody, be still self-sufficient in keeping one sober? Yeah, I mean, we probably, majority of us have that, uh, I was going to say one experience, but multiple experiences, that something so horrendous and so awful that happened during a, a bout of drinking, you'd think there's just no way I will ever drink again. Um, and, and fear is the, is, the, uh, is the solution we try to apply. Um, how many, we find out even, yeah, how many people have done that here, show of hands? Right? Everyone uh, became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. Um, how dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted in, into what I would like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Um, but there's more drinking before that, that occurs. Uh, in November, he sits drinking in his kitchen. Uh, with a certain satisfaction, I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. Um, this is this is the uh, the phase of development of shut-in drinking. <laughs> My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the end of the bed. I would need it before daylight. Um, his musing is interrupted by the telephone. We went over this on Tuesday night. Um, there's a cheery voice on the other end of the line, um, an old school friend who happens to be sober. Um, they hadn't seen each other in a few years, um, and he was amazed at his condition. Um, rumor had it that he had been committed for alcoholic insanity, and I wondered uh, had he. I wondered how he had escaped. <laughs> Of course, he uh, would have dinner, and then I could drink openly with him. Absolutely no regard for his friend's sobriety on the other end of the phone, right? He's already trying to come up with some sort of plan to get his friend drunk, right, with him. Um, I'm mindful of his welfare. I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other, of other days. Um, you know, and that goes back to the beginning of Bill's story when he says, you know, that alcohol cured his loneliness, that he felt like he had arrived. He felt like he was a part of something. And that's, again, something we're always seeming to, to try to recapture. Um, his coming was an oasis in the dreary desert of futility, the very thing an oasis. Drinkers are like that. So, you know, Evie arrives. Um, he's fresh skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. Um, he was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered how he had got into that, what had gotten into, that, into the fellow. He wasn't himself. Come on, what's all this about, I queried. He looked straight at me, simply but smilingly. He said, I've got religion. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right, but bless his heart, let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. But he did no ranting. In a matter of fact way, he told how two men appeared in court, persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. Um, they had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was two months ago, and the result was self evident. It, it worked. So, Evie, um, at two months of sobriety, um, started thinking about somebody he might be able to carry uh, this message to, got on a train, went to Bill's house, sat in his kitchen while Bill's getting drunk with the um, sole effort of carrying this message to Bill. He had come to pass his experience along to me. If I cared to have it, I was shocked, but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. He talked for hours, childhood memories rose before me. Bill starts to go through, you know, Evie's talking to him about something vitally important that could potentially save Bill's life. And what's Bill doing? He's drinking and thinking about himself. Um, you know, he starts to go on about how he'd always believed in a power greater than himself and that he'd often pondered these things. Um, he certainly wasn't an atheist. 
um, but that he had this prejudice in, in him. Um, over on page 11, we start getting um, um, a really key highlight about how Bill's willingness starts to shift. He does a little less thinking about his own prejudice and his own life and his own issues and starts to see the proof across the table from him. Um, on the, uh, the third paragraph, it says, but my friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that God had done for him what he could not do for himself. His human will had failed. Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. So that goes back to what Joe was saying in the doctor's opinion. These are cases that these doctors had come to regard as hopeless. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. Then he had, in effect, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Had this power originated in him? Obviously it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute. And this was none at all. That floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in a human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. He sat at a mirror, here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table. And he shouted great tidings. So what Bill is experiencing in this conversation with his friend Abby is that something was inexplicably different about him. There was something in his eyes. Here sat a miracle across the kitchen table from him. This is somebody that Bill's known most of his life. Um, he couldn't really deny the fact that something had gone on with Abby that had changed him in this incredible way. He saw that my friend was much more than an inwardly re reorganized. He was on a different footing. His roots grasped new soil. This is the beginning of the carrying of a message that has depth and weight, right? Bill can't do anything but notice the change. Despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of old prejudice. Here comes the thinking again, right? Um, he starts to go muse on about, you know, universal mind uh, or spirit of nature. He had resisted the thought of a czar of the heavens, however loving his sway might be. And it was Evie that suddenly says to him something that, that changed Bill. Um, why don't you choose your own conception of God? It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. That's it. That's, that's all Bill had to, had to do in that moment. Even sitting drinking across the table from Evie, um, the only thing required of him in that moment was a willingness. Um, a willingness to believe. Um, he didn't even have to have the beginnings of the belief yet. Um, over on the next page, it says that at, he, sorry, over on the next page, it says at the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise for I showed signs of delirium tremens. So this is Bill's third course of treatment. He goes back to Towns Hospital, back to Dr. Silkworth. Um, but the difference this time is that he has Evie to support him um, and, and Evie to show him this course of action which is actually outlined on page 13. And I'll just read it in its entirety. And you guys see if you can um, hear the common theme between what Bill experiences on page 13 and our 12 steps as they are today. Therefore, I humbly offered myself to God as they as then understood him to do with me as he would. I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself, I was nothing, that without him, I was lost. I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away root and branch. I have not had a drink since. My schoolmate visited me and I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. We made a list of people I had hurt or toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. And here we get a, a sense um, in Bill's experience how we know that something um, is inexplicably different. Bill's experiencing something different for the very first time. I was to test my thinking by the new God consciousness within. Common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction and strength to meet my problems as he would have me. Never was I to pray for myself except as my request for and my usefulness to others. Then only might I expect to receive. 
but that would be in great measure. My friend promised when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my creator, that I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God, plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things were the essential requirements. So Bill's been through a course of action. He's begun to have this experience. His friend has reassured him that when these things are done um, and, and given him a good education on what that experience should be like, and we'll find out what happens to Bill when he begins to have this experience. These were revolutionary, revolutionary and drastic proposals, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory, mm. followed by such a peace and serenity as I had never known. There was utter confidence. I felt lifted up as though the great clean wind of a mountaintop blew through and through. God comes to most men gradually, but his impact on me was sudden and profound. For a moment, I was alarmed and called my friend the doctor to ask if I were still sane. He listened in wonder as I talked. We were talking about on Tuesday that only somebody, um, you know, as hopeless as Bill had become, would start to question his sanity because he's suddenly starting to experience peace and serenity for the first time. It's like, where did all the calamity go? Where did all the static go? Where did all the crazy thinking go? Um, suddenly, right where you are, you start to feel at perfect peace and ease. Finally, he shook his head saying, something has happened to you, I don't understand, but you had better hang on to it. Anything is better than the way you were. The good doctor now sees many men who have such experiences. He knows that they are real. While I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who, who might be glad to have what had been so freely given me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They in turn might work with others. So that's Bill's experience in town's hospital. Um, when he arrives home, he says that his wife and, and him and Lois abandoned themselves in, to the enthusiasm, um, to the idea of helping other alcoholics to a solution of their problems. So he begins carrying the message to as many alcoholics as he possibly can. It was fortunate for my old business associates to remain skeptical for a year and a half during which I found little work. Most of us expect to be uh, presented with a job and a new life within our first two weeks. Um, Bill sets his, his, um, his sights on helping alcoholics. I was not too well at the time and was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink, but I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. Many times I have gone to my old hospital in despair on talking to a man there. I would be amazingly lifted up and set on my feet. It is a design for living that works in rough going. So he's saying that even in his first year or so, um, or first year and a half of sobriety, um, life didn't perfectly hand him everything that he uh, everything that he needed or felt he required. Um, he he used this recipe so that uh, he could he could continue to experience the things that Evie said he would experience if he practiced this recipe. The recipe being to um, acknowledge the self pity and resentment. Um, to look to his, this relationship with a power greater than himself for all things, and then to resolutely find another alcoholic to work with. You got that guy, Kim? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, he goes on to summarize, you know, the, the amounts of people um, that he's seen restored to sanity, uh, families brought back together, um, you know, I have seen men come out of asylums and resume a vital place in the lives of their families and communities. Business and professional men have regained their standing. There is scarcely any form of trouble and misery which has not been overcome among us. It's not that there is an absence of, of difficulties. It's just that there's a recipe for dealing with them. So we see so far what he was like, what happened, and what he's like now. So in regards to the two questions... What was the first thing that we all have in common? What were some of the answers on on, on the chat? Most of, most of them were allergy. Allergy. Um, there there were a few people that, that stated that um, it was the, the spiritual malady. Um, there was a few people saying the mental obsession. So I don't know if you want so, to try so and So in, in regards to have we talked about those two areas thus far? 
The answer is no, they don't even mention that. That goes outside of the scope of the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. A lot of that got added to this thing. But the doctor have, have, hasn't mentioned that, and Bill's story, they haven't mentioned that. So we see that what was the only solution for, the, for these types of people? You want the answer in the chat? Yeah, well, they, well, they should have, like, that was the second thing that, that the doctor... That was the second question. Yeah, and was there any answers to that? Mm, I don't see any. So, so the doctor talks about an entire cycle of change. So when we went through Bill's story, we seen what he was like. What's the what happened part in his story? So you hear a lot of people come to the fellowship. They talk about the what happened part as being their last drunk, treatment, detox, seeing the light or a consequence or coming to the conclusion they can't drink anymore or going to meetings. But what's the what happened part in Bill's life that gives starts a new story happening in his life that gives him a design for living? What is the what happened part? Any answers to that? So we see it's it's the psychic change. And until that happened, how well did Bill do keeping himself sober? And we see everything that he did under his own efforts or his own kind of power kept on getting him drunk and he was baffled by the idea. Then we see somebody explained alcoholism to him. And then he thought that was the answer. And it wasn't until Ebby showed up, carried a message to him, Bill put it in his life, and then he had a spiritual experience or psychic change. So where we're kind of getting into now, because it's quarter to seven, is we're going to go right into there is a solution, right? And, and, and it kind of reiterates what the purpose of Bill's story was, right? And this will start, now there is a solution, we'll start to expand on some of the ideas that we've already covered. You hear a lot of people say, oh, the first portion only deals with step one. Well, right now we've actually started to deal with what, what the nature of the problem is, what it kind of looks like what the solution is, and that there's a course of action. And we've been given examples to that, and we're just getting into there is a solution. And we've covered all those areas and given examples of that, and we've referred to the solution being outlined in this course of action. So we're going to cover, we're going to expand on that, that conversation of the mind, the body, the solution, and the fellowship. These elements that seem to take place that Bill started to establish in working with other people, the gathering and all this other stuff. So there is a solution, page 17. We'll kind of read through the first page because there's a lot of really, really wild stuff there. If you got your pencil, highlight some of the stuff that you think is interesting. And then we'll kind of, we're going to kind of pick up speed a bit on this, right? Did you want to read through that? Me? Yep. Okay. You want to start at the top of the page? That helps. You want to do <laughs> Usually you want to start at the tremendous back. <laughs> uh, no, no. Well, it, it kind of, see, what what this what it does at the top of the, a lot of times people, you hear things, what, what this is about, that's about, the book always answers its own questions. Well, what was the purpose of Bill's story, right? You hear a lot of people say, well, it's to find myself, it's to do this, or do that. It, the book answers itself, what was the purpose of Bill's story, and it will expand on it, which is really interesting in this in this first paragraph. It kind of has a lot of um, um, strength or, or reinforcement to what this is all about. Go ahead. We have, a, sorry, we have Alcoholics Anonymous, know thousands of men and women who were once as hopeless, just as hopeless as Bill. See, they, they all have... Yeah, they story. changed that thousands... In I think the th second edition, it wasn't in the first edition, right? They changed that number before it started off with a hundred men and women, right? I think we looked into that, Joe. When did you? When did they change that? They changed that in the second edition. So you hear a lot of people, you know, the real happy people in AA, they go, well, not everybody stayed sober out of the first one hundred men and women. Well, not everybody will stay sober here. That's why it says of those who really tried, 50% got sober at once of those who really tried. And then after a few relapses, just because you're sober now doesn't mean you're out of the woods to relapse again. That means those 50% that really tried stay sober and remain that way. That means to the time they died. So far, I'm a part of that 50%. Beforehand, I wasn't a part of that statistic because I never really did this. But since I've done this, since Joanne's done this, and since Joe's done this, and since thousands of people have done this, they haven't relapsed, right? And if they do, and then they come back again, then they become a part of the 25% after a few relapses. 
So you see, so the numbers go here, thousands. Now they're thousands. They're re-strengthening the hope that's available here, right? Go ahead. We have Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were just once as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. Which, how many people think that's good, good information? They're reiterating there again that we can recover. And not only was there a hundred, this reinforced, there's been thousands. And since then, how many people? Like hundreds of thousands, probably in the millions who have incorporated this way of life, who found a happy, joyous, and successful way of life. So if you jump down to the tremendous fact. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. So, we have a way yeah. out. Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in a brotherly and harmonious action. So is this for me? You hear, you hear people say, well, my soul, for me, recovery, mine. Collectively, this is alcoholism. If you have this problem, collectively, collectively, you have the same problem we have. Collectively, this is the same solution that we all agreed on. We have Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So they're all agreeing what the problem is, they're all agreeing what the solution is, and they're all agreeing what the course of action is. And collectively, they're all having the same experience. It's not my program. You hear people say, well, my program, my, it's not ours. It's their program that we put into our lives. It's their program that they incorporate in their lives to have the same experience as the first 100 men and women, or since thousands, if you want what we have. Well, we have a way out which we can absolutely get. We're all in agreement. It's not God as I understand him. People say get hooked up on that. It's the same solution for all of us. We'll find out what that is. It's the same understanding what the problem, solution, and the course of action is. It's not singular. It's collective. And they're reinforcing that here, right? This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. Do you want to skip down or do you want to just yep, go ahead? An illness of this sort, and we have come to believe it an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it, there goes annihilation of all the things worthwhile in life. It engulfs, engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents. Anyone can increase the list. So when, when we kind of look at, when we listen to ourselves or we hear people who are coming back, you hear them being hard on themselves, like they're blaming themselves for relapsing, right? So that puts it into a behavioral problem instead of an illness. If you knew you suffered from an illness and you were experienced the symptoms of continuously relapsing, that means it's untreated. That means I need to reapproach how I look at this or, or the solution necessary to do it. If you beat yourself up, you're reiterating that you should know better, that you should be able, without even realizing it, it's so subtle how we approach this. Or if you have a sponsee that's relapsing, you give them grief for relapsing. What they're saying here is you've now put it, the onus on them as a behavioral problem and they should know better, they should try harder, they should surrender more, they should do something within their own power to fix themselves. So that's what they're kind of saying. We give them grief for their illness. Instead of standing back as sponsors or people who've been through this, the reason you keep on realizing is because you're suffering from an illness and that you haven't experienced the psychic change or spiritual experience. And the reason you haven't experienced this at the level necessary to recover, you haven't done this course of action. Is that kind of, it's pretty, so then, so then the next part of this is really important to what this is all about, right? We hope this volume will inform and comfort those who are, or may be affected. There are many. Highly competent psychiatrists who have dealt with us have found it sometimes impossible to persuade an alcoholic to discuss the situation without reserve. Strangely enough, wives, parents, and intimate friends usually find us even more unapproachable than do the psychiatrist and the doctor. Yeah, anybody talk to us about our drinking, if something we can't stop or change or alter, we punish them for even mentioning anything where they don't say anything anymore. So the silence happens in the home. Right? Anybody ever punish somebody for t 
asking you about your drinking or you stop talking to them or avoid them or try to, because we don't know why we're doing what we're doing, right? And we get irritated when people ask us, what are you do? why are you doing that? Good question. Like, like you're kind of suggesting I have an alternative thing. Why are you always going down that road? You're suggesting that I have an alternate path. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So this right. th this next, I think, squiggly writing, this may be important. But the ex-problem drinker who has found the solution, who is properly armed with the facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. So, but the ex-problem drinker who has found a solution or this solution? This solution who is properly armed with facts about themselves. What are the facts that we need to be properly armed about ourselves about? What are those facts? Well, a good portion of the book has started to educate us on those facts already. And which are? The symptoms of alcoholism. Yeah, so when you understand that, and the hopeless feature of it is that we keep going back to it, regardless of what's happened to us, the, that the doctor reiterated, and witness of people of this type in this facility... So these, they're saying, like, when Ebby showed up with Bill, Bill, Ebby had the facts, but he also had a solution, and he won the confidence of Bill. When Bill talked to Bob, Bob, here we are, 2020, with the same recipe in here. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. So in Bill's story, where did the shift happen in Bill's story where there was a different story available for Bill? It was when Ebby showed up. Not beforehand. So it's the same when we go to meetings today. Until the same thing happens with us in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, our story continues to be the same. We keep on approaching this as a behavioral problem instead of an illness, but we don't know that. My 11 years in and out, I was under the impression it was a behavioral problem. It's something I could fix and I could alter it and I could change if I keep on trying harder. But when somebody presented the facts to me of oh, nearly... 31 years ago and introduced me to this thing it made perfectly good sense why I was doing the things that I was doing and why I needed to have this solution and I needed to do the course of action set up by those that went before me so collectively I came with the same understanding that they had on the problem collectively I understood the solution they applied to their life and what that was and what that looked like and collectively I did the same course of action they did so I became a part of the thousands it's not singular. So when we carry this message, I'm carrying the same experience of those of, of the first 100 men and women or since thousands. So if these people were in meetings, would they all sound the same or would they all sound different? They would all sound the same. Any show of hands, would they sound different or the same? For those that said they'd sound the same, kind of show of hands there. Right? And that's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The primary purpose of each group is to carry this message. And collectively, the first tradition says our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon a unity. The unity of this is our solution to our dilemma. But I need to understand what the problem is first. Until I understand that any solution will make sense. Sorry, I get carried away sometimes. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to get carried away. We could probably just skip ahead if you yep. want, or if you yep, want to go through go. it line by line. Nope, that's good. So... If if we kind of go over, let, let's go over to uh, um, 20. It is the purpose of this book. You may have already asked yourself. You may have already asked yourself. We're on page 20, and there is a solution for you guys, anybody who's, who needs to know where we are in the book, page 20. And hopefully, and hopefully you're going through this alone at home because it's your job to go through the book. Right. And it's your job to get educated. We're hitting the highlights to kind of say, you know what, like, let's revisit some ideas here. That's what the worksheets are for. So you go through this. Right. Go ahead. You may already have asked yourself why it is that all of us become so very ill from drinking. Doubtless, you are curious to discover how and why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. So how many symptoms again did they just cover? Hopeless condition of the mind and body. People add to that. It gets confusing because they take the human element, 
which we get into after we start talking about the human element a bit and we agnostics, but we really get into the human element from page 60 on through the rest of the book that we apply spiritual principles to. We apply spiritual principles to the human element, not alcoholism. We can't treat alcoholism. We have a treatment for it. There's a big difference. Right? But we need to understand the two different elements. There's the human component to this, and there's the illness component to this. So what we're looking at is the illness component of alcoholism with those who are afflicted by it. Yep. If you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? It is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically. We shall tell you what we have done. Before going into a detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone. Why yeah. can't he? How many people heard that? Just don't drink. Just don't take the first one. Just go to meetings. Just don't do it anymore. Like, did you have to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to hear that as a solution? I knew that before I even got here that I'm not supposed to do that. I'm here because I'm not able to not do that. If I was able to do that, how many people would have came to AA? So we had this, I'm going to go on a little thing here. We had somebody say, relapse doesn't have to be a part of your story. It is a part of your story. Otherwise, you wouldn't come here. If you were able to keep yourself sober, why would you come to AA? Why would you look for a solution? If Bill was able to keep himself sober, we see that relapse is very much a part of his story. So we say things that really don't make much sense. Then people say, well, you can't experience relapse if you haven't experienced recovery. Anytime you want to have a different experience and you're unable to do that, that's relapse from the goal or the idea or the hope. No? Yes? Sorry, did I have a moment there? Okay, no, go ahead. No, okay, no, go no. ahead. No need to be sorry. <laughs> Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine? Lay off the hard stuff. His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I <laughs> should think he'd stop for her sake. <laughs> I'm leaving that alone. Okay, go nobody, ahead. nobody ever called me a sweet girl. <laughs> yeah, like my, my, people used to say that if you could just control your uh, meaning, there's got to be a way you could drink without consequence because that's what I thought the problem was I'm always ending up in trouble I'm always having consequences I'm always doing so that's the problem it's not alcohol is not my problem I like alcohol it's the consequences associated with it how many people are aware of that understanding I'm an alcoholic because of the consequences how many people are under that idea the reason I'm alcoholic because the DUI I end up in jail the failed marriages the lost jobs, the inability to pay. Well, how many people who don't have a drinking problem end up in jail or have car wrecks or failed marriages or lose their job? Or hmm. So interesting, right? The doctor told him if he ever drank again, it would kill him. And there he is all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. And even in our own fellowship, that's why I was talking to Joe and Joanne, people like us within our own fellowship. There's a certain type of alcoholic within our own fellowship that doesn't, are not able to get sober uh, based on a percentage how these other people are getting sober. And these other people are getting sober by the, you know, uh, by, well, I'm trying to be nice here. By, by something that's happened to them, they had a revelation, and, and then you hear them. You know, I went to treatment, or I seen the light, or I surrendered. I just, you know, I just stopped picking up, and th they're still their own solution, right? And they're able to stay sober. The only requirement for any membership is desire to stop drinking. So you hear them, they do a singular act, and that keeps them sober. I play the tape through. I take 24 for me. I pass it around. These are the things I do to keep me sober. Those things don't work for alcoholics of our type. And that's what the fellowship was built on or this book was built on for alcoholics of our type that moral psychology or self-fixing self or trying to recreate our lives based on self and desire isn't enough. That's what they mean back of them is a world of ignorance. That's why we 
certain people, guilt newcomers who are coming back or relapsing all the time, we think guilt, shame, and, and shaming them publicly in a meeting or belittling them will be enough to keep them sober the next time. That have you learned your lesson? Have you done enough research? Like how, that's an ignorant statement. Have you done research? Meaning you, these people made a conscious decision to go back out and, and ruin their lives continuously. The reason they go out again, because they suffer from an illness. If they could have stopped themselves from going, they're not going out to do more research. What's taking them out is this illness of alcoholism. And those of us that understand that are no longer backed with ignorance. We understand what these people are suffering from. And we're the people that 12-step these people. Like when I seen Joanne struggling all those years, I just kept on working. When I seen Joe struggle, I just kept on working with him, educating him, introducing him this course of action, and it speaks for itself. Whether we wanted him to or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're here. You don't need my, I don't need your permission. <laughs> <laughs> So just to, just to back up on what Tony's saying, we see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. The, the, what they're referencing is, is people who have a different reaction to alcohol than we do, right? These are people that have never experienced the allergy, right? So that's where their ignorance and their misunderstanding comes from. Or, um, it's very or the second part is the malady, this thing that happens in the mind that happens with us that doesn't happen with other people. We're not quite there yet, though. Well, the doctor talked about it a bit, and Bill talked about it a bit. Somebody pushed a drink my way. Was I crazy? Well, they go. They start going into the different types of drinkers, right? Yep. Like, you know, these are the people that that have sort of these misunderstandings. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Um, then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. If a sufficiently strong reason, so ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor, all of these things that we try to, to hang our sobriety on, um, becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate. Um, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. But then they go on to say, what if the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. We can probably actually see that through the elements of Bill's story we went through tonight. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So when they use that real alcoholic, you kind of a lot of people get offended by that. There's a lot of potential alcoholic. Then the real, they're saying, what about the real alcoholic? All these other methods that we just talked about, falling in love, ill health, warning of a doctor, self-talk, um, uh, um, frothly emotional appeal, all this stuff won't work for us. We'll weigh, we will pass a lie detector's test and I'll never do it again and I'll mean it and we'll do it again. Like Bill's story, right? The real alcoholic. I had a moment there. I'm all right. <laughs> well, it, it also goes back to the doctor's opinion, right? Talks about it. Once having formed the habit, found they cannot break it. This is the progression of, of this allergy taking place, right? That's yeah. why that's... And also the condition of the mind. Yeah. And finding it astonishingly difficult to solve. It, it becomes the takeover, right? A hostile takeover within the mind. Because they're talking about here, there's groups of people that can keep themselves sober based on certain ideas, falling in love, right? A, a warning of a doctor, self-talk. But what about the real alcoholic? The only thing that saves these people is an entire psychic change. There's nothing else. So we're building on that idea here. Okay, go ahead. You want to skip over to the bottom of page 22 and we can start moving on to... Oh, yeah. Let's get yeah. into the good stuff. Okay, so now that we've got a pretty strong education on this allergy, and this is the common symptom that, that we all have in common, um, it says at the bottom of page 22, so that's page 22 and there is the solution, we know that while the alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We are equally positive that once he takes alcohol, whatever into his system, something happens both in the bodily and mental sense, which makes it virtually impossible for him to stop. The experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink. True or false? In the chat, true or false? 
These observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink. So, Getting all true. So yeah, so if I never took the first drink, I wouldn't trigger the phenomenon of craving and then there wouldn't be consequences in association associated with my drinking drinks with I see others taking with impunity I can't because I have this allergy so the only solution that they offer for people like us is an entire abstinence but if I can't stay abstinence then there must be a different problem that's what they're kind of going to get into here right well if abstinence was the solution to alcoholism then this would be a very short book right it would just be avoid the first drink don't suffer the consequences of your drinking thanks for showing up Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind. Sorry, true, let me true. back up there. Yeah, true. Well, yeah go ahead. These thereby, mm -hmm. sorry, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the terrible cycle in motion. Therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. Are they starting a new conversation here? Yes, we're no longer talking about the symptom, the physical symptom. We're talking about a new symptom. So we're all agreed that if I never took a drink, I never trigger the allergy, right? But they're saying that's not the problem anymore. The main problem centers in our mind rather than in our body, because why do we keep returning to it? And that's what the doctor says. This is repeated over and over. So now they're going to get into the second symptom of alcoholism, which is least understood and least talked about in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. But now they're going to give us, like they gave us the label for the first symptom was the allergy. And so we built conversations on that, the phenomenon of craving here. Here they're saying now the main problem centers in the mind. So we're going to look at this as a concentration now of a new conversation of the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. We're going to cover the mind part now. Joe, you're going to hang around for a second? I've got to get the phone. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. If you ask him why he started on that last bender, the chances are he will offer you any one of 100 alibis. So another word for alibis would be these excuses, right? If you know that you can no longer safely drink, if you know that you have the allergy, we're talking, it's a new conversation. We're not talking about somebody who's trying to control and enjoy their drinking. We're talking about somebody whose main goal is to no longer repeat the desperate attempt of the first drink. Um, he will offer you any one of a hundred alibis. This is the list of reasons that we give constantly um, when we've relapsed, right? The external circumstances, the, 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 the job, the, the relationship, the financial situation. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility. A lot of the time, these these um, these alibis or these excuses, they sound relevant. They sound like perhaps maybe they're plausible. They could be the reason. But none of them really make sense in light of the havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of a man who, having a headache, beats himself on the head with a hammer so that he doesn't feel the ache. If you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, he will laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. You want to expand on that, Joe? Yeah, well, it's uh, it's like being called out for your drinking by anybody, right? It's uh, you're making up an excuse to why you do it because you really don't understand why you do it, and so any other idea that you come up with it makes good reason for why you do it. But to people witnessing what you're going through, it has it doesn't make sense. It's 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 an illness. It's plain insanity to why you do what you do. And then and that segues way into this next paragraph here, which is the truth, right? Most of us in our hearts, we really we don't even know, but something we've made up makes sense, right? We're just trying to get people off our back. That's kind of what that top said, right? Yeah, it's like how many people has relapsed here before coming to AA? Said I was never going to drink again, and you drank again. And then even come to a show of hands, how many people have sworn to never do it again and, and you promised people and you meant it, you know, snot running out of your nose and you're so remorseful, you're never going to do it again. And then you did it again. And now you're baffled at that, so you need to come up with an excuse why you did it. How many people told the people, I did it because of this person, this situation, I got situational sobriety. As long as the situations are all right, I'll, I'll maintain sobriety. Well, the situations are never all right, right? That's what, so as long as I give myself an excuse why I do it, then I'm not beyond human aid, am I? I just got to watch out for that trigger. It's those triggers, right? That's why I relapsed. Well, 
that's not why they're saying we relapse here because the main problem of the alcoholic centers where in, in, mind. in the mind and we need if we come up with excuses why we do it then we could still depend on who Us. so that goes into the segue where we're going here i love the way this is leading up to this eh? it's like almost like entrapment okay go ahead once in a while he may tell the truth and the truth strange to say is usually that he has no more idea why he took that first drink than you have some drinkers have excuses with which they are satisfied part of the time but in their hearts, they really do not know why they do it. Remember, Bill, somebody pushed a drink my way. Was I crazy? Right? That that kind of moment. Like, anybody ever come to after, like, while drinking, go, oh, my God, I'm not supposed to be doing this? Why they do it. Now, now they're going to qualify this. Once this malady has a real hold, they are a baffled lot. What malady are they talking about? What malady are they talking about? Write that down. We're going to spend a couple seconds around this because this is the building block that leads to the idea that leads us beyond human aid that makes more sense. The more I understand it, the more I understand why I have to have a psychic change or spiritual experience and I can't rely on me to keep me sober. They're I have, explaining. I have, I, you guys in the chat, I, you're all wrong. I, it's, you're, I'm getting spiritual, 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 craving, allergy, well, spiritual, so, spiritual. So this, this is good, right? Because yep. how many times have they talked about the spiritual malady so far? Zero. Zero. So they started a new conversation of where does the problem lie? In the mind. centers in the mind. So they started this new conversation. Why are they baffled? Why are these people baffled? in their hearts they don't know why they do it yeah do what C continue to drink once this malady has a real hold they're a baffle lot what this condition in the mind malady is is um, my wife has her master's in english and if you look up the word malady it has a lot of different different um uh explanations of what it could possibly illness this 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 but really it's really undefined it's a condition that's really undefined but it is a condition that centers in the mind. It's a malady. It's really hard to pinpoint the characteristics of it, but the characteristics of these people keep on drinking and they don't want to drink and they're baffled. So the second symptom in alcoholism centers where? In the mind. And they call it what? A Ma malady. malady. That's why they're baffled. There's a condition in the mind, they call it a malady. They can't see, feel, and touch it, but when it becomes present again, they're drinking. And they're baffled. Does that kind of make sense? How many people have heard that before? Explanation on this page. We don't like this page. We like the other page. Where I could just be aware of it. And work on me. And I don't call a friend. Call a sponsor. Think it through. Self working on self. And now we're going to get into the second part. What is the. Uh, I'll, we'll revisit and get. There's the obsession. So once this malady has a real hold, there are a, they are a baffled lot. End sentence. There is the obsession that somehow, someday, they will beat the game. And what's the game? Try to stay sober. But most people will think to control and enjoy their drinking. Most people will say that. But we've already agreed on the pre previous page that if I never took a drink... We know that I can't take a drink because of the allergy. I'm resigned to the fact that I can never safely drink again. But I keep on drinking again. So they're saying here, right, there's the obsession. What's the obsession of me keeping me sober? Self trying to fix self. Yeah, because I, so I'm not baffled anymore. This is everything I'm going to do to fix me. How many people, including ourselves, have heard people talk at great lengths what they're going to do to... To have a different experience this time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And when we come back, we say, I'm going to do this. I'm we're obsessed <laughs> with us fixing us. We're our first obsession. Son of a bitch. That's not good news. Because I may not be much, but I'm all I think about. How many people spent all day thinking? The obsession. This constant chatter in the mind. Anybody have a problem? You spend all day. You created, but you're spending all day trying to fix it. How many people spent all day trying to fix a problem that they can't find a way of fixing? But it doesn't stop you from thinking about it. So here, here's alcoholism. They're saying it's an illness that centers in the mind. 
it's kind of call it a malady, but we really, mm, it's kind of interesting now they're starting a new conversation. We've seen how obsessed we were with fixing ourselves. How obsessed was Bill with fixing himself? Oh, we saw that through, through his entire story, right? Fear sobered him for a bit. He tried, he attempted to sober himself on self-knowledge. These are all the things he tried to employ to stay sober, to keep away from the first drink. This is not the example or the story of somebody who's trying to control and enjoy their drinking. This is somebody who desperately understands that they they cannot safely consume alcohol in any form at all. But now the obsession becomes how do I stay away from that first drink? How do I stop the desperate attempt? In the first how drink? do I beat the game by not taking the first one? Right. So we've seen now it goes period, but they often suspect they're down for the count. When did Bill suspect he was down for the count? After a second time in treatment, I would say. Right? He, wasn't he? Second, yeah. right? So it kind of reiterates what they're talking about. Often they suspect they're down for it. Now they're going to keep that conversation going. This is the first time they use the word obsession in regards to us fixing us. Now, then they're going to say, but the tragic truth, like, see, everybody following along here, how this is set up here? Because it's not about the allergy anymore. We all agreed. And it's about how do I stay sober under any and all conditions? Well, I see I can't because this thing that they're referring to as the second symptom in alcoholism is the malady that centers where? In the mind. We don't like that because that places us beyond human aid. We'll continue to be baffled. Right? So, the tragic. Is that a good word? Tragic? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, so we're I think following, we can all relate yeah. to that. <laughs> oh, we're losing a lot of people now. They're just going right off the paper. We do not like this truth. Uh, it doesn't change the fact whether you accept it or don't accept it. At least we're getting educated on it now. That's what this whole point is about. And a lot of this will go against a majority of what we've been taught all along. But what does the book say? If we get back to the basis of what the book says and get re-educated about facts about ourselves, then it makes more sense what I need to do. The tragic truth. The tragic truth is that if the man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. arrive. There's he that word lost. again, real alcoholic, this condition that centers in the mind. He has lost control. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. Stop. And some of us could do it for months or years, but we find we return to it again. Was that not Bill's experience? How many people's experience has that been here? So it's interesting. They're talking our language now. What language are they talking? They're talking the language of alcoholism. This tragic situation has already arrived arrived in practically every case long before it is suspected. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. And what do they call this characteristic here? What do they call these symptoms or this characteristic or this explanation? What is the term to explain this, this paragraph? What term did they use to explain this paragraph? They call it a malady that centers where? In the mind. This is the characteristic of it. And the baffling part is when we use a lot of the fellowship likes the word obsession because we could kind of look when that's happening. But when they talk about this malady, when it happens, we're baffled that we keep on drinking. So th so in regards to this, they're talking about a condition in the mind that the real alcoholic seems to suffer from. And the only solution for these types are people that need a psychic change or spiritual experience. Well, how would I know if I had this symptom? They already talked about it. Long before it's suspected. So if I look back at my drinking history, how many times did I say I wanted to stop and was unable to stop? How many? How long is a period of sobriety was I able to get from my own determination only to find myself drinking again? That's what they're getting at here at certain times. So that means 90% of the time I'm able to say no. 
and then somebody pushed a drink my way and I took it. Was I crazy? How many people looking back on your attempts of sobriety, how many people found themselves taking a drink again? So that's what they're getting. At certain that we've lost, lost the power of choice, which makes us powerless over alcohol. So now they're getting into this whole idea. What do you mean I lost the power of choice? Well, they're going to expand on that, right? The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. Huh. I'm going to read that again. <laughs> the almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer do not crowd into the mind to deter us. Wow, eh? Wow. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. <laughs> there is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. The alcoholic may say to himself in the most casual way, it won't burn me this time, so here's how. Or perhaps he doesn't think at all. How often have some of us begun to drink in this nonchalant way, and after the third or fourth, pounded on the bar and said to ourselves, for God's sake, how did I ever get started again? Can Only you, to have that yeah. thought supplanted by the, well, I'll stop with the sixth drink, or what's the use anyhow? Anybody been there any bar pounders here <laughs> okay that's our five minute warning tony it's 7 okay. yep uh, when this sort of thinking is fully established in an individual with alcoholic tendencies he has probably placed himself beyond human aid well let's stop there so what happens is now they're going to get into this characteristic of the malady and they're going to expand on this idea now they've covered the allergy pretty much in, in great detail. Now they're going to get into the main problem of the alcoholic, which centers in his mind, and they talk about a power, losing the power of choice, and then they talk about this characteristic makes them beyond human aid, right? And they're gonna, we're going to follow through on that this week. So continue to read this this week, and, and we'll kind of carry on. Um, Joe kind of left the, the scenery there. I was going to get him to talk about the, the sheets and, and the talks that are available online for those who want to get a little more in-depth. Joanne, if you want to hit the seven tradition again for us, please, that would be great. Hey, guys. Um, just a, a little bit of housekeeping and a reminder about our seventh tradition practice. Um, we are currently experiencing an unprecedented, unprecedented situation in Alcoholics Anonymous right now. Um, for the very first time, uh, not just locally, but globally, um, in our 85-year history, a lot of our meetings are, are experiencing temporary suspension. Um, and the inability to pass a physical basket has been hindered. Um, and uh, we're, many meetings are finding ways to pass a digital one. Um, you might be asking why it's necessary to continue practicing the seventh tradition at this time. A couple of reminders would be that your home groups are likely still paying rent, even though they can't physically convene right now. Uh, your intergroup offices are still fielding 12-step calls and redirecting current AA members to find online meetings. They're also stocking needed literature. Your local districts, like uh, District 40 is hosting this meeting, um, are, are hosting telephone remote community meetings. Um, these platforms aren't free. Um, they're also providing links to our area delegates as the general service conference is still going ahead. For the first time in the history of the conference, it'll be held this year via um, an online platform. And your general service office in New York, the staff are still showing up to work. Um, they're still working to support all levels of service. Literature still needs to be distributed. Calls still need to be answered. Online platforms still need to be maintained. Um, and all of this, guys, costs money. Um, and if we want to maintain our, our, our tradition of not accepting outside contributions, um, you can find a way um, through safely to, to do online contributions through aa.org or get in touch with your local DCM or local district treasurer to find out how you can contribute to your local intergroup office. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Joe, you got a minute? You want to hook us up? With the, the sheets and the talks, and anybody looking for extra help? Yeah, I was just I was just typing something, but uh, for anybody that wants to get involved with this and, and follow along on the YouTube link, we have sheets available on our YouTube channel. The channel is Tony R. Vancouver. Uh, we have the PDF format of the Big Book Study Sheets. I've been pumping out uh, my email on here, and a couple other of our members from our home group have been pumping out our emails, and we're all providing you with the same sheets. Um, we have a talk designated... Uh, we have we have an eleven uh, piece talk uh, that takes you through the sheets, 
and other talks that talk about certain areas of spiritual aspects that I want to, and all around uh, the basics of the book and beyond. So, again, if you want to get involved, email one of us, and, uh, and thanks for participating, guys. Awesome. And we're going to, uh, Tuesday, we're going to pick up where we left off, read more about alcoholism this week, and we're going to pick up the pace a bit. But we need to get the foundation down on, on the conversations and the symptoms of alcoholism, what we'll be expanding on. Kim, did you want to add anything to that, Kimberly? Absolutely. Just a reminder that um, tomorrow night, Banny Paw will be taking over our meeting. The young people in AA in Vancouver are going to be having a fun-filled night, so I can have the night 